Welcome to FACT's webinar called Trees for Livestock, Food, and Medicine. Our presenter today is Steve Gabriel from Wellspring Forest Farm and the Cornell University Small Farms Program. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. So before we dive into the presentation, just a few quick, quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust are FACT. Uh, we are a national nonprofit organization that's headquartered in Illinois, and we work to promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program, which provides a variety of opportunities to livestock and poultry farmers. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. So please visit our website to learn more about all of our farmer services, and we'll be announcing new webinars and um, other services to help farmers address the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic very soon. So at this time, I'm very pleased to introduce our esteemed presenter, Steve Gabriel. Steve is an agroforestry extension specialist for the Cornell Small Farms Program, and is also the managing editor for the Small Farms Quarterly. He's co-founder of the Finger Lakes Permaculture Institute and has written several books about solo pasture. Along with his wife, Liz, Steve stewards Wellspring Forest Farm in the Finger Lakes region of New York, where they produce shiitake mushrooms, duck eggs, maple and elderberry syrups, pastured lamb, and forest fruits. So we're very lucky to have Steve with us today um, to share his experience and ex as expertise. I'm, I'm just delighted that he could, could join us. Um, so without further ado, I am going to turn the floor over to Steve so that he may begin his presentation. Please take it away, Steve. All right, so good afternoon, there. can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. Happy to be here. Um, hope just sending well wishes out there to wherever you're at and whatever situation you may find yourself in, in terms of the craziness of the pandemic. But it's a great time also to reflect and learn and uh, I think up our resilience game uh, and silver pasture and agroforestry have a lot to offer in that realm. So I'm happy to share, happy to answer as many questions as I can um, at the end of the presentation, but I want to dive right in. There's a lot of details um, to cover with this. So uh, thanks for the intro. I just want to mention from the get go, it's really important for uh, myself and, <clears throat> and my wife and our farm to acknowledge the land that we are farming on, which is Goyankono or Cayuga uh, land. You may be familiar with the Cayuga or the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois, Six Nations Confederacy. This is, these are the um, indigenous people that have traditionally uh, been on these lands. Um, and of course, there's a long and storied and complicated and challenging history to reckon with. Um, and that's a lot to say in just <laughs> one sentence, but but we acknowledge it, we acknowledge that the uh, land that we're on has um, has a past, has a present, has a future, as do the Guyancono people who are, are currently still on these lands today. So we're really grateful to be working and living and stewarding uh, these lands to the best of our um, ability. Uh, so, there we go. And, and, and the reason I, I especially want to present this in the context of our conversation today, oops, sorry, go back, there we go. Um, is this idea of agroforestry, which we can think of as an umbrella for so many different types of practices that bring trees into farming landscapes. So agroforestry is the umbrella, silvo pasture, which is specifically looking at trees and livestock is underneath that umbrella. There's other things such as windbreaks, riparian buffers, uh, food forests, um, forest farming practices, literally hundreds of hundreds of different practices around the world that we could call agroforestry. What's really important to remember is that agroforestry used to just be called farming. It was really only coined a term uh, in the 70s, but these uh, a lot of the agroforestry practices worldwide are rooted in indigenous land use practices that didn't separate the field from the forest and didn't see trees as in the way of production and, and agriculture and subsistence. And so, so with that in mind, we try to honor and recognize the, the roots of these. And, and as I learn about different practices, I'm really interested in, in learning about those origin stories. So this is my mentor, a uh, forester and a friend and a neighbor, Mike Dunn, who is part Seneca, Haudenosaunee. And he um, has taught me a lot about the forest and the ways that we see the woods. And he's been doing uh, logging jobs in the Finger Lakes for the last 40 years and you'd walk in a woods that he logged and you wouldn't even know that it had been cut. 
So there is a way to do sustainable forestry that you're to manage with, I think, a, a, a certain perspective, a certain philosophy, and a certain approach that can be beneficial to that, <clears throat> that forest and that landscape in the long term. So I just like to honor that from the, from the outset. <clears throat> so our farm is um, about 50 acres, half late, half leased and half owned, um, as Larissa mentioned, in central New York in the beautiful Finger Lakes region. Um, if you look on a map, there's like 11 little fingers. So we're kind of right in the middle of that. And we produce a, we're a small diversified farm that produces a lot of different things, um, mushrooms, maple syrup. Our pastured lamb and duck eggs are really where the civil pasture shows up. Um, we also do elderberry and a number of education and agritourism um, things as well over the years. And that allows us with all these different revenue streams to um, stay diverse, to deal with the environmental challenges that we're facing, all of us as farmers, and also to deal with the market challenges and changes that are constantly happening. Um, and a great example is what's happening right now. So our agritourism, which is a, a Airbnb rental on a, on a yurt on our farm, is uh, we're seeing those those cancellations um, come in, which is to be expected given that people aren't traveling um, here and um, don't know what it looks like in the future. But our mushroom sales are starting to really go up drastically. We're trying to keep up. So uh, because people are really interested in the immune system support those mushrooms provide. And so... Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of where I see small diversified farming being really important uh, as we continue down this interesting intersection of environment and um, and social and economic um, changes that are inevitably going to continue to come in different forms. I'm just waiting for the slide to advance. There we go. And our vision really on our farm is to farm in the image of a forest, meaning that wherever there's existing forests, we steward those and wherever there isn't forest, we work to plant trees and reforest. Um, so our hope is that when we walk off the land someday, um, one way or the other, that uh, what we find in our footsteps is a forest, not a beat up, dilapidated, compacted, <laughs> nutrient deficient field. That the set of fields is what we really found when we arrived here in 2011. So during our um, seventh full season in production, um, we've been on the land for closer to nine years and building relationship with it over that time. And you can just see us out here. So we have a mix of forest, uh, kind of common of these farms, you know, half half woods and half open pasture. Um, the orange and yellow uh, boxes there, the lands we hold title to, and the red is where we lease land from our neighbors, mostly open land for, for grazing. So it provides a really nice balance and we're able to start with a really great system and then and then uh, build it from there. Um, we're going to kind of an aspect of that. And really for us, civil pasture entered the landscape and became something really critical for us to understand and to value. Um, it was in 2016 when we had a dark drought in our part of the world. So we're in that red blotch there, kind of towards the bottom right corner of it, which was D4 drought, which was actually the driest year on record. Um, and so we found ourselves in a situation, this was our roughly our fourth season, our flock was starting to hit its uh, stocking capacity. And we had, you know, developed these really nice grazing plans and had thought we'd, you know, had everything figured out. And of course, uh, drought came unexpectedly and, and persisted for quite some time. Um, yeah. Along with all the, all the others, we were grappling with what to do in that. And obviously, it's going to be... Um, hey, uh, Steve, uh, we've had mm -hmm. some um, reports that the audio is a little bit choppy. Um, I don't know if it's like your internet might be, or if it's like how the distance from you and the speaker, but um, it was, it was fine until like a minute ago. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could, I could try that. Does that sound any better? It don't, that sounds better to me. Okay. Does that sound better to folks? Yes. Okay, cool. Hopefully that helps. Yes, yes. Thanks for that. Feedback. I know it should be. I'm, I'm at a good connection. Uh oh, it's pre camp cool. again a little bit, but I, we might just have to. Yeah. <laughs> it's back and forth. Hmm. Yeah, I'm on a speed of internet possible around here, so it's, it's the fiber optic, so it should be good. Hmm. Should we keep going? Well, I'm wondering, do you have a, do you happen to have a phone nearby or is that, yeah, I know, 
Do you want to try? Okay. Um, sorry, folks, for this technical <laughs> intervention, but I think the internet these days is just completely getting over. Um, let's yeah. try. So what you might want to do is go up to the three little dots at the top of your screen, and it will say switch to phone, and it will give you the call in. Okay. All right, thanks folks for your patience while we're waiting for Steve to try that. <laughs> that other uh, option, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah, so folks are saying maybe I should go on mute and I actually have been on mute except when I interrupted Steve. So here he is, let's see if this is any better. Hello, Steve. Hi, how's it sound? I, yeah, sound it's not choppy, yeah. Can everyone hear him? Okay. I think so. Okay, let's go with this if that's all right. Sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, I know everyone's on the internet, so I imagine even the best of connections is a bit slow. Great. So, yeah, let's go back to 2016, which was another minor um, <laughs> minor catastrophe in our area, which was this drought. Um, so, anyway, we were uh, experiencing this. Uh, we had done our first rotation of the... the the sheep around the property got back to our first paddock and didn't have any regrowth, like didn't have anything to feed them. And it really was just this moment of, a, you know, assuming we'd have this great plan and we'd figured all these things out and then we didn't really know what to do. And and so uh, folks in our area that had livestock were, you know, searching high and low for food. We're debating about getting grain for supplement. We're driving to Pennsylvania and Delaware and other parts just to pick up hay and silage and things like that. And um, we really love on-farm resources. One of the things we value about ruminant livestock is that we don't have a feed bill um, for most of the summer because we're grazing them. And that's where really we can see a, a profit potential, even, even if it's still kind of marginal. But we really looked to our land, and when we looked on Google Earth, which what I love about Google Earth is you can um, use a measurement tool to get a sense of um, distant acreage and, and square footage and all that great stuff. We looked at these edges of our farm that we'd largely neglected and said, oh, someday, um, most of them so thickly wooded and covered in scrubby brush and, and all that good stuff that we didn't even know it was in there, honestly. Um, but when we added them all up, it was about 20% um, total land was in this kind of scrubby, edgy habitat. And we realized that given the drought, um, that the intensity conditions, the, the temperatures were way above normal as well. Um, and noticing in these areas that the vegetation, the woody vegetation looked pretty pretty good, pretty green, pretty lush, um, we thought, you know, maybe our sheep would, would have a go here and see if get them to... Uh, to take to that and and potentially reduce that need for outside inputs to the farm. So we we have a breed of sheep called Katahdins. That's originally a, a cross between um, English breeds and Saint Croix, which are a Caribbean breed. And this was a um, relatively new breeding uh, line developed in Maine. Mount, they're named after Mount Katahdin in Maine, and um, and the idea was to produce a, a meat uh, breed that had uh, no uh, fiber. They shed their coat. Um, and that were both sort of cold hardy and heat tolerant as well. Um, and uh, and so um, and also the interesting, I guess, characteristic for them from a browse perspective is they kind of um, are goat like in the sense they'll go after woody stuff almost as uh, they prefer that almost equally to the to the uh, grasses and the forbs and the things we normally think of in a grazing system. And so we we had seen a little bit of that, but we tried to up that and we basically fenced them into these areas and did a lot of pruning and thinning and giving them access to trees when they couldn't reach them and basically just fed them off that landscape and it was a, you know a bit biblical if that's your thing because it was a 40-day experiment we had them off the pasture for 40 days and in these hedgerows and just found uh, remarkable results at the end of the year our lambing weights were no different than in any previous year and so that's a really good indicator you know, they were comfortable and there was no weight loss during this really hard uh, time during the drought. And so uh, at the same time, um, we're really looking for anything green on the farm to potentially feed the sheep. Uh, this is a willow wind windbreak that we planted in our first season that um, was just starting to mature, get above the browse height of the sheep. And we thought, heck, let's try to um, let them have a go at that as well. And we didn't talk about willow, which we'll talk about later in the presentation, but um, 
but we noticed that they would eat some, but they would um, they wouldn't strip everything clean, and uh, and this is because of the condensed tannins that are present in willow. It actually provides some medicinal benefits to talk about, but um, but also limits intake by the animals, which can be a good thing because we don't necessarily want our animals to be stripping trees all the time. So this is really where like our foundation of understanding the benefits of civil pasture. Off the pasture literature, it's heavily focused on the fact that you could restock and also grow most often timber uh, species for like a long-term harvest. Um, my assessment, a lot of other foresters, is that really that's maybe a, a potential problem in uh, parts of the south uh, or uh, or areas where trees grow really fast. But in our climate and our poor soils, I don't think timber is um, a good long-term investment. As, as a primary function anyway. I think fruit and nuts can be a good one. Um, if you want to also manage the uh, fruit and nut uh, layer of that system, which is kind of like doubling or more your management per acre. But um, I really want to be a proponent of, of, for a lot of farmers, the the base shade shelf fodder value that, that these trees can provide. Really, um, if we focus on those things, it, it, it does a lot of, um, does a lot for us in terms of seeing the benefits directly to our livestock's health and well-being, also their humans, um, feeding them diverse diets, uh, feeding them nutritious diets, feeding them um, trees that have a lot of trace minerals and things that we don't often find in our forages and things like that. So that's really good where we're going to say now. Not to say that you couldn't do a silver plant, you know, for for timber or. Um, or four trees and nuts, just keep in mind the sort of market forces and the added management um, that goes with that. So tree fodder is beautiful because it's really about trees and nesting that within the grazing system. Um, and what I what I really think about when I think about these things is that uh, these are wonderful because both in the wettest of years, which actually 2017 was one of our wettest years on record after 2016 being one of the driest, um, they uh, woody species look kind of the same, whether it's a super dry year or a wet year or somewhere in between. And I think this is a really important characteristic of these plants that we're going to need to leverage more and more if we're going to have um, reliable food sources for our animals um, on the farm. So when we talk about feeding things to animals, I just want to put up a couple words vocab-wise because um, these things get thrown around. And, and frankly, there's not a fixed definition, and sometimes these are used um, interchangeably, but Generally speaking, for them can actually mean almost everything that you could feed to an animal that's leafy and green. But most often, I'm trying to um, encourage folks to use it in the context of the things we find in the, in the pasture, um, the grasses, the legumes, and the forbs, um, although forage has often been extended to wood as well. Usually browse is the way we kind of distinguish woody uh, uh, vegetation from the stuff on the, on the pasture floor. Um, fodder would be um, something that's a little fed to animals. Um, in this case, my wife feeds the sheep some willow in a cut and carry system where we brought them from another part of the farm. And then there's, of course, mast. And often when people get into civil pasture, they think about masting um, yields, soft mast being fruits and hard mast being nuts. Um, keep in mind with mast is those usually, those, those harvest events only come once a year um, at most. And so the rotations and the, the potential benefit to animals, it can be a, a really limited window versus some of the other leafy green vegetation, which you know can be browsed uh, much more frequently. So we're going to talk about tree fodder in particular. We're going to use that word. Um, and so when I was researching for the Silvopasture book, um, if you haven't checked the website, silvopasturebook.com, a couple things there, um, a whole page of videos and recent presentations I've given, podcasts, media, articles, all that good stuff. Um, you can order the book directly from us there, um, which is the best way to support our <laughs> the struggling author world. It certainly gives us the most return as when you might order it from a, a supplier online. Um, we also have an online course on there. We, we just wrapped it up, the live version, but you can actually still um, uh, get access to that course if you want to sign up and you get six weeks of content that mirrors the chapters in the book and has a bunch of videos and interviews with folks um, in the field. So still really valuable even if there's not kind of a live component right now. And then when you sign up for that online course, you get um, access to 
um, the content for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, uh, so next year when we do another round of live presentations, you'll be able to get those as well. Um, but anyway, you know, all this to say, the book itself, when I was digging in, it was after that drought and wanting to really understand more about silvopasture and finding the resources to be uh, particularly lacking in, in their clarity. And one of the, the questions I get often asked the most often is, you know, what species should I be thinking about? And when I got to that point in the book, I was going to do a profile of just, you know, dozens and dozens of species, but I decided rather to go narrow to focus on the species that might give us the most sort of um, bang for our buck. And so I, I listed out a bunch of criteria that were important to me as a farmer. Um, and so, again, keeping in the mind that my main goal is shade, shelter, and fodder for livestock. So fodder research was really an important criteria. I wanted to see species that were highly adaptable to lots of different elevations and microclimates and sites across the cool temperate climate and even beyond that, but I was focused on cool temperate regions of the world. Um, fast growing species because what I'm finding which I want to get them in the ground and get them growing tall enough essentially um, so that livestock can be integrated with them. So if I'm waiting you know, 15 years for a tree, it's very different than if I'm waiting three or four years. And that's what we're really doing with the majority of species is excluding the livestock for three to five years <clears throat> and then um, and then bringing them back in with the trees. Uh, trees that are easy to propagate, really important. If you're going to plant lots of trees, you've got to be able to propagate them yourself because the cost of buying lots of trees is, is most likely prohibitive or, or is going to slow you down. And then hopefully some secondary products as well. So I pushed sort of hundreds of different species through these, this, this filter of criteria, if you will. And these were the four that, that rose to the top. Um, like bar none, far and away, these were the four that really um, <clears throat> really started to show some impressive results. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of these um, and, and encourage you to consider these as a really good starting point. Now, you, of course, can add a lot of different tree species that you might have other goals for. Um, but these are the ones I would recommend at least giving a, a first glance at and are really going to work, I think, um, with you in your, in your journey. And what's interesting is if we compare sort of what often is recommended for pasture management, where we want a grass composition of around 75% and legumes maybe 15-ish, forbs around 10%, these trees, these four species actually really offer kind of a, a good template for um, for this. And so <clears throat> one of the things we're looking at our farm long term is, is having predominantly, you know, these more grassy like, so the willow and poplar um, composition is more like the grasses versus the black locust being a high protein um, fodder and the mulberry being a high mineral fodder kind of has an analog to these pasture things. So don't take that as a, <clears throat> and that's of course not the only thing we're going to feed our animals, but just as a, a, a guidepost, I think that's a helpful thing to think about. Yeah, and so here's a summary of, of what these trees offer. Um, <clears throat> the willow and poplar are really lots of biomass. The difference mainly is that the willow is going to have those tannins, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Black locust or some kind of analog um, legume if you don't want to do black locust. Uh, I know there'll be questions about the invasiveness of black locust, and we can, and I put that in quotes, uh, we can talk about that when we get to Q&A. Um, mulberry um, really is amazing because it's highly digestible, even by pigs and poultry. So out of all these trees, if you're, if you're raising monogastrics, meaning animals with a single, single stomach, um, mulberry would be your best bet to play with because they can actually make use of the, the widest array uh, sort of profile of that, <clears throat> of that fodder. All right, so willow, um, <clears throat> lots of different species of willow, over 600 species worldwide. There's actually willow <clears throat> growing in most climates in the world, different um, varieties. So in addition to high biomass, this, these tannins, um, <clears throat> they do two things in the rumen and, and animal gut. So one thing they do is they slow the rumen down, they balance out the digestion. And they actually um, add an interesting profile to the sort of um, microbial activity in the rumen. But all that leads to two things. It creates an inhospitable environment for parasites to multiply, which if you're a small livestock producer is very appealing, and also reduces their methane. They don't burp up as much essentially because they kind of slow down. It helps balance out the rumen. So this alone is worth having willow on the site and worth giving your animals exposure to willow. I know that <clears throat> dairy farms around the country are experimenting with seaweed as a, fe a feed additive to dairy cows to reduce their methane. Um, but there's not a lot of dairy farms that actually are right next to the coast. But every dairy farm in this country 
could be growing willow and could be feeding it as a way to reduce methane. Um, and the, 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 those willow could be planted along stream banks and actually help with nutrient runoff issues as well, right? So you know, just a little food for thought there. Um, incredible uh, species for uh, carbon sequestration, uh, for filtering and, and capturing nutrient runoffs. Great. Uh, really one of the only things out this time of year, at least in New York, that's a pollen source. <clears throat> and then there's other applications for willow for windbreaks and, and stream banks. <clears throat> and uh, above all, you know, willow is amazing because you just cut a cutting, stick it in the ground, <clears throat> and it pretty much grows a tree. Too bad not all trees <laughs> are this easy to propagate. But um, what I found over time is you want to take a cutting, uh, ideally in the dormant season or just when the sap is starting to run. So right now in the northeast in New York, this is about the time you want to take cuttings. Um, although willow is pretty tolerant, you can get away with doing it pretty much any time of year, I would avoid the driest or the hottest parts of the year. But um, And there's really no point in cutting it really in the deep winter. So this is a good window right now. Take a cutting. It should be diameter-wise about somewhere in between your pinky and your thumb in thickness. It should be uh, anywhere from 6 to 18 inches long. The key is wherever you're going to end up sticking it, pounding it, planting it, you want at least three quarters of that woody material to be underground. So this is a bad, <laughs> this photo is showing a bad practice, which is we cut these way too long. We pounded them in. This is a swale we had planted them in, so it was a nice raised bed that was very soft soil. So the roots could get established, but um, it's just too much for the sap to climb all the way up that you know foot or more of material. So it really would have been better just to cut these off and, and just have a little nub sticking up from, from the ground. So you know, just keep that in mind. You kind of select your, your length based on what you're actually going to, uh, pound the material into um, as you go. So really easy to do, really easy to propagate. Your best material for propagation is guaranteed on your farm, down your farm road, down your neighbor's farm road, somewhere around you. So start looking out for willow and take cuttings and propagate it and play with it. It's, see what does well on your site. You can, of course, order. The Vermont Willow Company um, has a ton of willow. There's others out there. I think I have a slide with some resources for nurseries, but willow is everywhere, and you should look for stuff around you first. Um, and so this is a willow project in Prince Edward Island in Canada that I visited, an agroforestry project where the government was paying potato farmers. It's actually the island is very well known for potato farming apparently. I didn't know that until I got there, but what I did know is it was well known for its seafood and especially, especially the mussels that grow in the bay. And if you can see kind of in the back left of that photo, that is the that is one of the sounds, one of the bays where mussels are harvested. So the government was paying these potato farmers to plant these willow buffers to intercept runoff. And um, these are a basket willow, really common, like purple osier willow, Salix propria, um, be, uh, the general. I'd, I'd, I'd recommend starting with that if you had a, um, had a choice. Um, there's a lot of varieties, a lot of hybrids within that, but Salix propria or the basket willow or osier willow family is all good. Um, yeah, so they were planting these, and the, what they were finding is that the willow has an incredible, incredibly fibrous and dense root system that um, would suck up, uh, uh, basically it sucks up all the fertilizer, almost all of it, over 90% of the fertilizer. It partitions the phosphorus, uh, mostly to its shoot growth, and the nitrogen mostly to its root growth, so they're looking at proportionment of those nutrients. And these willow were growing two or three times faster than they normally would because, of course, they're getting all this extra fertility. And so basically they were reducing or almost eliminating the, the, the runoff going into the bay. They were growing this massive willow, and in this case they were growing it to, um, uh, to uh, harvest and use in a digester to create electricity for the farm. So this farm was actually becoming um, sort of neutral from an energy standpoint because of this willow uh, biomass that they're using. Um, this system inspires me to think about it as a tree fodder system. So you could harvest this on a rotation. You wouldn't cut all this down at once, but you can harvest each row kind of on a rotation and you could have plenty of material and also couple it with this kind of benefit to to keeping our water clean. So that's just some of the data um, there and the, one of the research <laughs> reports on this. There's a lot if you want to dig into the benefits of willow for, for nitrogen and phosphorus capture and essentially uh, accumulation. So here's Salus propria. This is a hybrid called Fish Creek. You can see how tall it grows, um, really rapid growth. Um, this is a Japanese fodder willow, Matsudana. Um, this is crossed with an Alba white willow. 
Um, but there's just a ton of different varieties out there. So some, some of the benefits of getting in some plant materials, you can get some of the hybrids that'll grow insanely tall, insanely fast. But also I encourage you to harvest stuff locally and just propagate that and see what works well. There's so many different types of willow and depending on your system, what you're interested in, um, there's a lot of different ones to play with. There's not the perfect one. So yeah, there's some, uh, there's some uh, resources for you. Best way to propagate is by far from dormant hardwood cuttings. Let's talk about black locust, um, the one people love to hate, but, uh, you know, heck, uh, I would love to have a tree that is nitrogen fixing, that is fast growing, that is producing rot resistant wood, and it demands that I manage it because if I don't, it gets out of control. So that's very true. Um, it is, I like to use the words more like persistent or um, opportunistic rather than invasive. It is not an invader. Um, I think humans are invaders in the landscape. I do not think trees and plants are. I think they are opportunists. And the reality with black locust in New York State is that um, we want to claim it's non-native, but the reality is that um, the people who brought it here were, were humans making that decision to bring uh, black locust into the environment. So most of the black locust plantings that we have in our state are, um, are from farmers who actually brought them in and, and from indigenous people who've been cultivating them for thousands of years. So I, you know, I don't need to go down the rabbit hole of the argument, but I think it's important to recognize and question the sort of... Um, categorization of something as good or bad, uh, especially when it's a plant. Um, and so uh, what's great about black locusts is it's bringing fertility back into our systems. It's providing rot resistant wood. We could actually replace the entire pressure treated wood industry with, willow, with locusts if we were taking it seriously. And then it provides a high uh, protein fodder for our animals. Um, so, you know, and, the, and the reality is what happens is if you don't manage it is it tends to spread very vigorously through its root system and they'll do root suckering and root sprouting. And that's where you get these thickets of, of locusts that everyone says is a big problem. The good news with the system is you can graze those root sprouts and really keep it in check. So we've been planting willow on our farm since we started, or excuse me, locust, since we started. And there's been no spread because the animals are grazing in the alleys and there's no advantageous root shoots spreading beyond where we want the trees to be. So. I don't recommend people plant black locusts if they're not going to manage it or if they're not going to graze it. But if they want to graze it, it's one of the best species, um, I would make the argument. Um, incredible carbon sequestration, both above ground and below ground. This is a rot-resistant wood. The old saying goes that if you want to use a locust post for a fence post on your farm, you put the post in the ground, you put a rock on top of the post. And when the rock decomposes, your post is ready to be replaced, right? I mean, just incredible incredible resistance. Um, when we look at the nutrient compounds, um, basically is, is almost nutritionally equivalent to alfalfa as a really high quality feed source for animals. And again, in droughts and dry times, um, while alfalfa is pretty tolerant, it does require tillage, it does require uh, reseeding every you know, three, four, five years. Um, black locust could be a really sustainable source of fodder for the long term. So here we are planting. What we like to do on our farm is plant really dense and then thin out. This is how Mother Nature plants trees. She doesn't plant them 20 feet or 30 feet apart. She plants them really, really densely and then thins out the ones that aren't, don't have long-term viability. So we generally plant about a meter apart, three, you know, maybe four feet in some cases, but often two, three feet, that sort of thing. Plant really densely. This is in 2013 with these, um, I think these were two-year-old two seedlings. And four years later, we have, whoops, sorry. This is our, this is that same row. Um, they're about 25 feet tall. The bark is hard enough that we can regraze with them. And now we're starting to thin these out and do some coppicing and pollarding to produce tree fodder, in addition to maintaining an overstory of these trees. And again, no uh, advantageous root shoots have, have crept out and caused any problems. So in the managed grazing systems, really, really wonderful way to do um, to, to, to work with locust and make sure it's it's where you want it. And our sheep absolutely love it. They will stretch their necks up and get every last leaf they can um, and, and love adding that into their diet. And so our, our initial prunings, our initial treatment and, and care for the trees is to prune them while they're leafed out and then give that material to our animals um, as we go. So I can't speak uh, enough about it. Here's a 25-year-old locust plantation um, in our online course. We had a uh, presentation from Brett Chedzoy, who has run this farm for about 25 years. It's his family's farm. It's a 350-acre uh, Angus beef cattle operation where he has several plantations that were originally um, black walnut and black locust, um, and he harvests his fence posts. He fenced most of his farm from locust posts that he harvested off the, off the farm.
and if he was um, didn't need them himself, he could sell these for a pretty penny as well. This is probably the highest value uh, wood around us right now in terms of dollars per per foot for per linear foot, because mostly you sell locust posts whole um, unless they're split. But mostly you can grow them to this kind of length, sell them as fence posts, sell them as hop posts, sell them as garden fence posts, and make a pretty good profit. And and Brett's a forester for the state of New York, and also says that if a farmer really wants to get a cash crop, they could grow black locust and probably get a return in in six, seven, ten years um, from this. Um, it's probably going to fare better than some of the longer timber species going on. So there's some prices, uh, what we're finding for them. So, so really good prices per linear foot um, for black locust. If you're a beekeeper or you like pollinators, um, this is black locust is probably one of the better uh, pollination sources in sort of late spring, early summer. It is a legume, and so it has these pea-like flowers that um, are actually really delicious to eat yourself, but incredible source of pollination. In Hungary, they do a lot of, uh, they've been working with black locusts since the 1700s, um, since they made contact with this continent. They brought seeds back and did a breeding program, and now um, uh, there's many uh, sources in Hungary that say that they wouldn't have a honey industry, which is pretty large in that country, without the black locusts that have been uh, sort of naturalized to the landscape. Uh, there's some papers and some information. Really, the Hungarians have done the majority of improvement. So one of the critiques of black locust, if you want to use it for building material or fence posts, is it, it often grows kind of crooked. Um, I've found that just planting it close together and thinning tends to uh, increase the, the straightness quite a bit. But there are some um, varietals out there that are supposed to grow straighter and taller, although they're not easy to get in, in this part of the world. Here's a plantation from Hungary where they did some of this research just to show you um, what that can look like. Um, and sorry, these slides are a little sluggish. And there's some nurseries. So the best way to propagate black locust um, would be from seed. You basically soak the seeds overnight in a pot of water that you first brought to a boil and then um, left uh, off the stove. But you just throw the seeds in there. They swell up overnight. They sprout. They're almost as easy to plant as lettuce. Um, you could harvest from root flares. You can actually dig up um, and, and transplant some of those. It's a real pain in the butt, and it's not super successful. I'd really recommend seed as the way to go. Again, if it's if it's in your local landscape, um, collecting the seed can be one of the more viable ways to, to go about it. Um, um, you can also purchase seed from many of these these nurseries and others. Um, always always source local. Always find folks in your region if you can to source this material from. So that's number two. Number three would be poplar. Um, so very, uh, very close relative of willow, um, but higher intake because there's really low to no condensed tannins in most um, most species in the poplar uh, group. Um, and so uh, this could be a real staple of fodder systems. And in New Zealand, they actually actively promote willow and poplar for farmers to plant in their grazing systems. Um, as a as a sort of um, emergency food source and and for the other benefits that we we tend to get from that. So willow, uh, excuse me, poplar is um, is pretty remarkable in that it grows. It's one of the few trees that grows at really high elevations. So here in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, we have the aspens um, growing at this high elevation. One of the only leafy trees that can persist there. We also have cottonwoods, which grow in some of the lowest, hottest, and driest parts of the country. So here's the desert in Arizona with uh, very periodic rain and very intense dry conditions where this tree is obviously doing quite well in that kind of floodplain mentality. And there's kind of everything in between. So um, it's an interesting, there's a lot of interesting potential. One of the questions with tree fodders is like, when is it best to feed or when can we capture the most value? Um, a lot of work in New Zealand was looking at um, when it made sense to uh, harvest that for animals based on the digestibility. This is uh, coming across some of this research is what first piqued my interest to do some research on our farm, which I'll talk about in a minute here. Um, but just pretty remarkable, um, the potential to think about this as, as a way to provide a food source, um, perhaps in a part of the season when we don't have other things um, rapidly um, growing. So just to be clear, you know, there's different poplars. We can group them kind of, you know, some of the columnar ones often bred for windbreak or, or, or visual screens um, are there. The aspen ones, which we focus on the high elevations and then the kind of um, dry and flood, the kind of ebb and flow zones, often the cottonwood poplars are the ones we lean on. So again, consult with the ones that are uh, native or local to your area and, and give some consideration. Um, certainly some of the hybrid ones are often 
the aspen poplars are often the hybrids that are that are produced um, and and uh, more evaluation really is needed to know which varieties might be the best for fodder, but they're all going to be good for fodder um, regardless of that. Um, that's another study I'd love to love to encourage someday is to look at the differences between these different species and um, pretty much the exact same uh, propagation as willow. The only difference being you need to have these bud sets in your cuttings. Um, willow will kind of sprout advantageously from anywhere, but you definitely want to have a top bud and a bottom bud, and you would just plant the the cutting, which is usually taken as a dormant hardwood cutting. Um, again, just to the 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 tip here, where this top bud would um, would be at the top of the soil. And um, there's a nice guy online who, if you go to hybridpoplars.com, I think he'll still send you some free ones because he wants people to plant trees. <laughs> but you can propagate them yourself. We do hundreds a year in a very small bed. It's very easy to do. Um, and so a couple of resources there. Um, sometimes rooting hormone is a really good recommendation. I often encourage poplars to do a bit better. Willow actually produces its own rooting hormone, um, which allows it to, to, to grow vigorously. And you can actually soak willow cuttings in water and then soak other cuttings in that same water and actually transfer some of that rooting hormone to poplars and other things you might be taking cuttings of on the farm. So a little tip there to help with things. All right, and then finally, mulberry. Um, so mulberry has been used in China for a long time as a feed source for pigs and poultry. And most often, they're harvesting the leaf material and actually turning that into a pelletized feed. In this case, they're actually feeding the leaf material right out. And this is really just because the Chinese have been planting mulberries for a very, very long time, and mostly um, uh, in support of the silk industry, but have figured out a long time ago that animals could benefit from the high, uh, relatively high protein, high mineral, and especially high digestibility of the leaf material itself. Mulberry, out of these four species, is the hardest one to propagate. It does take a little bit of reading and, and playing around and figuring out your setup, but it's it's very doable, um, and and I think a really important one to have on our in our landscape uh, if we're interested in tree fodder. Um, there is a really cool website called Feedopedia, kind of like Wikipedia, but for fodders and feeds. Um, so you can look at some of the uh, information nutritionally. This is the profile for black mulberry. Um, and so you can get a sense uh, of, of what that could look like if you visit um, that website. I have a couple more sort of databases I'll share with you about that. Um, in South America, lots of uh, use of mulberry in what we call fodder blocks. So these are blocks that the trees are shaped and grown <clears throat> to be at browse height, and the animals can go through once, maybe twice, maybe three times a season if you're in the tropics, uh, and graze these down and, um, and get a lot of nutrition. And then they can actually also grow a berry crop. So the benefits of being in the, the tropics, right? Uh, not in a cold climate, I wouldn't expect that we're going to get that many grazings out of it. Maybe maybe one uh, or maybe two, depending, if we wanted to mimic this type of system. But very productive systems uh, down in, in tropical regions of the world. Uh, mostly South America is where I'm familiar with them happening. Um, my friend Akiva, Twisted Tree Farm, which is in central New York. Akiva also has a wonderful book called Trees of Power, which is um, published by Chelsea Green Publishing, same publisher as the Silva Pasture book. And that's a wonderful book because he talks about many of these species and really gives you a sense of how, to, how easy it is to propagate and really encourages you to look in your local landscape um, for, uh, for things. So, um, yeah, so, and on his website, a, a bunch of free articles. If you look for Twisted Tree Farm, there's one about propagating mulberries that I'd really recommend you read if you're going to get into propagation of them. A couple of other articles. Um, I'm actually reorganizing our website, and I'm going to make sure these are on there. But there is a resource page on the website that has links to these articles. Um, and give me some time. I'm, I'm uh, currently uh, trying to update things over the next couple of weeks. But there's um, some good. There's a lot of good fodder there <laughs> on the website already for you to check out. But I do want to do uh, highlight some of these main papers for the tree fodders. I'm, I'm going to double check and make sure they are all there for you. Um, so here's some. Nurseries, again, propagation uh, often with softwood cuttings, or you can use seed as long as they're from fertile trees. Um, some some mulberry are self-fertile, and some need multiple trees. Um, so it's, it gets a bit complicated with them, and we won't get into it right now because of time. But um, you can read those articles for, for more info. And again, they're all listed on the website. Um, but you can do softwood cuttings, and usually you need a rooting hormone, and you have to put them under mist and often in a sand bed. And so it's a little more complicated than the other ones. but Certainly very doable and much more economical to do on farm than to than to always buy in material. 
So last thing I want to share um, is really about, you know, okay, that's cool. There's some species. If you were to start a silvopasture fodder system with just those four species, um, I think you'd find a lot of benefits to shade, shelter, nutrition, and medicinal qualities for livestock. Um, they'd be fast growing, they'd be pretty cheap to propagate, and we would create these abundantly um, productive landscapes that sequester a ton of carbon, um, quite literally. So, so you know, start with those four, I would encourage, and then branch out from there. What are other species that either are on the landscape or that I want to add in for other reasons that might be good for my, my shade, shelter, and fodder goals? So the last thing I want to talk about is really the this idea that we don't exactly know or we need to learn more about how nutritional content changes over the course of a season. And so this is something we're actively doing on our farm as far as researching. What we do know about trees and plants in general, but specifically trees, because with grasses and forbs and legumes, we're often clipping them multiple times a year and they're regenerating and regrowing. Well, we don't know what the impact of that is on our woody fodders as much um, in terms of how many times can I graze it, what does that do to the energy reserves in the plant, all these kind of things. And and again, when is the best time to capture the most value? So um, if we look at uh, this graph here, it's, it's just suggesting with any leafy crop, we have a leaf out phase, a full leaf, and then a senescence where the, the leaf is actually descending. Things are going back into the woody materials, into the roots, into storage, and then leaf drop. So we know that towards the top of that peak or that peak, you're going to get um, a good uh, a good uh, nutrition, perhaps peak nutrition, but that's not the only thing in terms of palatability. So let me dive a little into the nuance of this and just leave you with this as a, as a thought. So what we do know is that um, different species of plants, and um, I have European buckthorn on this list, not because I want to encourage you to plant it, it is another sort of non-native plant, but it is very persistent and present in our landscape. And we are actively thinning and, and reducing its presence, but at the same time it's there and what we've noticed over time is the sheep love it. And so we're really curious to know what, what it has to offer. And one of the things it has to offer is it stays green really late into the season, like almost till Thanksgiving time. And that's really valuable from a tree fodder perspective. So you know, what is it offering? What is its role in the landscape? How do we manage it and control it, not encourage it to spread, but also as we're controlling it, perhaps offer it to our livestock as something beneficial. Um, if it's already there, it's already planted, it already has a root system, it's already a tree fodder, and I don't have to put any management energy into it other than to manage it to produce good food for my livestock. And so there's benefit there, and we have to be realistic about are we going to remove everything we don't think should belong in the landscape and try to replace it with all new stuff, or are we going to try to look at the benefits of all these different species? So one benefit is that if we stagger different types of species, we're going to have those, those curves spread out throughout the growing season, as you can see here. So willow um, starting really early, black locust being somewhere between, and the buckthorn going later in the season, just as one example of a species palette. So there is another web... Um, uh, what do I want to say, link here, another database that has a ton of different data about um, tree fodder values nutritionally. You can look by species. It'll actually, if you go, you can actually look at the research paper that the numbers came from and really dig in if you're interested in something in particular in your landscape. This would be the go-to place. This is a Danish, uh, Danish project that's really great. That slides, I believe, being sent to you. Um, for our part, what we've done is we acquired a grant from Northeast Sarah, which we're really grateful. Our report from year one, which was last year, is now on the homepage, um, or it's updating right now. So if you wait an hour, <laughs> it'll be linked from the homepage of our silvopasturebook.com website. What we wanted to do is undertake a study where we did tree forage analysis um, throughout two seasons at our farm and really started to map the nutritional changes and the values for different species. Uh, in New York State, in our farm, in the Northeast context. Because while it's great to have that database from the Danish, it's all over the world, and there's going to be a lot of variation depending on the soils and the climate and all those sort of things. So we did six species, um, three that we planted on our farm and three that we found sort of growing. And I picked three that people love to hate. Uh, so we have black locust, uh, poplar, and willow that we planted. And then we have buckthorn, honeysuckle, and wild cherry that were found on the landscape. So you can see here the summary data. And again, you can dig into the report later if you want to chew on it more, um, ruminate on it <laughs> if, you want, if you're a punny person. Uh, but here's the kind of summary of the different species. 
uh, the crude protein, ADF and NDF, if you're not familiar, are really just measurements of different components of the forage that help us understand a bit more about how digestible they are. So we want low values. And when we compare the values of these woody species to legume and grass pasture, those figures there at the bottom of the chart um, for legume and grasses are uh, averages for New York State samples provided by the, the company we work with, Dairy One. Um, it really see, shows that they have they have good promise in different ways. Um, there's and, and and that I wouldn't say there's one that's better than the other. They all kind of offer something different to the picture, uh, especially as we dig deeper. So, so that's one piece of it. Um, we we also charted and looked at different um, aspects like um, nutrient values, so macro and micronutrients. What's really interesting is that there's not again one species that is the one, but they all offer something. And what I think is really fascinating is that. Buckthorn and honeysuckle in particular offer a lot of high nutritive value that we don't find in other tree fodders and that often are deficient in our forages. So it's sort of like, oh, okay, so here we have these plants that maybe we didn't value but um, have some value in the landscape. Um, and so we see uh, buckthorn having high calcium, potassium, and iron, for instance, and honeysuckle having high iron, calcium, and magnesium levels, right? And then zinc, poplar and willows are incredibly high uh, zinc providers. These are all nu nutrients that um, um, you know, can, can be deficient or, or not as, as abundant in some of the forages on the pasture floor. So the report gets into a whole bunch of other <laughs> nuances there. Uh, we did track also changes over the season. So we look at the values. Not surprising, the cr crude protein content for all species is declining over the course of the season. Um, but still pretty high for things like black locust, you can see, is, is still pretty good even towards the end of the year. Um, and so the summary is, and, and again, this is all in the report, every species kind of has its own potential time of the year and, and potential value to add. And I think the more and more we are to dig into the species, I think we can assume that the more species diversity, um, the better as we, as we go through. All right, so... I'm going to pause there because I think just with time and questions, that's good. Um, the only other thing we didn't talk about right now is a, a little more nuance about ways to manage tree fodders. But um, on our website, we do have a, um, another tree fodder webinar that is recorded that the end of that gets into that a bit more nuance. But I think we want to probably spend some time on questions before we run out because um, I mean, we could talk all day about tree fodders. But hopefully this gives you... Uh, a starting point to to get to get playing with this stuff. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Do you have maybe oh. ten minutes, to, or do you want to? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'll just go through some ones that came through uh, earlier in the presentation. Someone was wondering about the breed of sheep that you that you raise. What the name is? Sure. So they're called Katahdin, uh, yes. like Mount Katahdin in Maine. Awesome. Um, let's see, scrolling down. Um, let's see, I sent out links to, just so, so folks have the links to, um, I'll include them in the email, links to the slides in PDF format, the recording, and then also Steve's uh, various websites. Um, someone's asking about, so there were a couple questions about um, if, sorry, um, black locusts, they're, they're poisonous at all to, livestock in any kind of amount or quantity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I'll comment a little bit about toxicity in general. Um, generally, if we look into individual cases of toxicity, uh, what we find is the reason animals become, have a toxic reaction to eating too much of something or the wrong thing is because of a couple of reasons. One is they're not familiar with grazing and foraging their own diet and creating some kind of balanced um, nutritional profile for themselves. And um, I'd really recommend consulting the work of Fred Provenza and Utah State University about that because <clears throat> that's a really important piece to understanding um, um, animal behavioral preferences around food. But that's one reason. The other reason is they're, they're sort of kept in confinement in one area for too long and they get bored or they run out of food and they just eat whatever's there. Um, mm -hmm. And the third reason is because they have some kind of nutrient deficiency or imbalance in their diet, and they may try to overcompensate by eating something and eating too much of it. So black locusts, really, if you dig in, it's mostly the cases of toxicity have to do with horses, have to do with horses in confinement, and horses who are fed a mixed ration who aren't given full sort of agency in balancing their own diet. 
and so they're not familiar with how to balance. So all that being said, um, the Cornell University list of toxic plants for grazing animals, my sheep seem to love almost all of them. <laughs> and it's all because they're exposed to them at low amounts, they're given the option, but it's not the only thing they're given to. So they love swamp milkweed, they love milkweed. black locusts, they love wild cherry, they love all these things that are supposedly toxic, which can be toxic in different uh, ways. I don't want to. I don't want to say they're never toxic, but, but we have to understand the context of what toxicity means. Generally speaking, an animal that is on is familiar with finding their own diet, has the freedom to choose uh, from a wide buffet, and is rotationally grazed is not going to have um, uh, problems with with overeating or with getting a toxic reaction. So black locust gets lumped into that because it can be overconsumed and cause often bloat because it's high protein. So it's the same as if they ate too much alfalfa, what would happen to them, right? That's really what it comes down to. Thanks for that. Uh, someone was just re, uh, asking for clarification about the recommended di diameter for the willow cuttings. If, uh, if I recall correctly, it was between sure. pinky and thumb size. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, pinky and thumb. Your, your pinky and thumb are good measures for generally how long. And then again, the depth is you want to be able to get at least three quarters of the length underground, whatever you're planting into. Let's see. Um, let's see, I'm just scrolling down. Have you, uh, do you know of any issues with silvopasture pasture in dairy sheep? Someone is asking. I imagine just for nutritional. Um, that's a, that's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very broad question, so it's hard to know. Uh, issues can mean a lot of different things. I think the biggest thing I will say is from knowing folks who are doing uh, rotational grazing systems for dairy is one of the advantages that a meat farmer like our, us have is, or, or someone who's doing just meat and not even fiber, is our um, monitoring of dietary balancing is, is so much less. And so I would say that you just have to factor that in um, in terms of, of your product and thinking about if tree fathers are going to be a piece of this, what are they adding and, and what, you know, I know that, um, for instance, too, too many condensed tannins can actually show up as a flavor in, you know, milk, just like tannins show up in, in good wine, <laughs> but you don't usually want them in milk. So there's definitely some considerations around that, um, but it's, it's in line, I think, with a lot of other nutritional balancing that folks do when they're, when they're doing dairy. So hopefully that's helpful. Excellent. Um, someone's asking if you could talk about predator challenges and how to deal with that in a more forested environment. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess our approach on our farm is uh, sort of threefold. One is um, good, hot fencing. Uh, both keeps the animals in and keeps predators out. We use net fencing for most of our operation. We have some winter paddocks with uh, with wire fencing for the sheep, but um, mostly we don't worry about a lot of predators in our area except for during lambing season. So we try to keep our animals um, closer to the, the main farm and, and that sort of thing during lambing. But other than that, um, um, uh, you know, a good hot fence is great. Uh, we we have dogs that roam the property and, and our, their presence has done a lot. Um, um, the third thing would be the way that we, we understand, I think with predators and I think with predators, both the livestock, but also the trees, <laughs> we could extend it because deer and rabbits and things like that. We have to recognize that um, their persistence and their impact is not the same on all landscapes and it doesn't, it can change over time. Um, and so paying attention and learning, you know, actually who's on the landscape and who's coming through can be really important. Um, so for our instance, for us, we, we, we can identify the deer that are coming through and their habits, and we've actually been able to do some, some management with our friend who's a, a wildlife biologist to encourage them to kind of keep moving <laughs> through our farm landscape and, and head off. Um, and and that, that requires some particular expertise, but I guess the, the thought I want to seed right now is just pay attention to the nuances of, of, of how things change and how they're unique to your landscape. Um, with our ducks, I'll just mention too, if you're getting into poultry, we have two guard geese with our ducks. So we have the dogs, we have the electric fence, and then we have guard geese. And um, we read a lot years ago that if you raise a couple male goslings with your ducks, that they would imprint on the flock and actually treat the flock as their female. And it turns out it worked for us. It took us a few <laughs> a few geese to get there. Uh, but we have two, Gary and Gilbert, and they're, they're in their... Uh, 
like getting on 10 years old and they, they actually herd all the ducks into the house at night um, and stand by the door most nights and wait for us to close them in. So it's pretty amazing. Um, so I'd recommend checking that out. If, uh, and on our farm website, we have, uh, if you go to wellspringforestfarm.com, um, uh, another grant we did with ducks and geese, we did a uh, sort of a, a final report about raising ducks that has some more info about that. So you can, it's a free download on the website. Awesome. Maybe we'll take, we'll take two more questions and then um, we'll have to wrap up. But someone's asking, let's see, they, if you're kind of starting from scratch, you have an empty pasture area, how do you decide where to plant? your trees. <laughs> I know that might be, you know, more of a broad general question, but you have any kind of <laughs> yeah, tools sure. or places to even, yeah, make that decision. Yeah, I mean, it's a great time to, to shamelessly plug the, the book and, and the online course because um, that's a complicated question. And so what I would say as an answer, at least preliminarily, is it's, a, it's where your personal goals as a farm intersects with what the farm environment needs or wants or, or what would work within it um, um, mixed with uh, the, the goals for the trees themselves. So it's sort of this intersection to me between like what am I after as a manager, what does the landscape want to support, and what kind of trees are going to kind of meet both of those goals. So um, what I often encourage folks to think about with civil pasture is starting with your most marginal land, whether you're existing woodland or open land, and work there because you can only kind of go up versus, you know, trying to put trees in your best pasture, I don't think is, is, the, is the place to start. Looking for edges of the fields or existing hedgerows or things that you might be able to expand out from that might be beneficial to enhance with more tree planting. Or like if you think about if you do hay, let's say, where are those annoying corners where you're, you want to turn the tractor and you don't want to have to go back and kind of do some awkward maneuvering? Let's like cut that out. I went to a farm in Ireland um, when we were there in November doing silver pasture stuff, and this farmer was brilliant because he figured out where his turns were for his equipment, and those corners that he didn't want to deal with is where he planted his trees. So think of those edges and those marginal areas, those places you're not paying attention to, and that's like one of the best places to start. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Um, Okay, and then one last question that was asked by a couple people. They're just wondering why you recommend black locust over honey locust. Oh, sure. Well, honey locust is not a robinia. It is not in the legume family. Um, there is some controversial evidence that it might fix nitrogen, but if it does, it is not from the traditional way that legumes fix nitrogen, and so it's not going to give you um, – uh, that benefit. It is not necessarily a high protein feed um, and it is it has high condensed tannins actually. So there is work in Virginia at Virginia Tech working with honey locust um, um, and and they found the tannins. It's, it's almost like um, more of a willowy type benefit than a, than a locust type benefit. So it's not to say that's not a, a valuable species and I know in the Midwest it's really common the other consideration is that where I live in, in New York State with um, rocky, heavy clay soils and colder a colder climate, we, we just don't see honey locust growing very well. It grows really slow here. But I know when I went to Virginia, when I've, my, my family's from Illinois and Wisconsin, um, I mean, locust grows you know, kind of like a weed there. So um, it's, it's got good fodder value. It's just different. And I would say if you got it, you know, it's, silver pasture would be a great way to work with it and to manage it and to value it. Um, but it didn't make the top, those top four, um, mostly because it just didn't offer the, the, the sort of kind of all the checkpoints on that list, if, right. if you can imagine right. that. So. <laughs> yes, getting, yeah, the top four. Um, excellent. But well, I know it's know confusing because we... <laughs> locust, yeah. The same name, yeah, the, I know. Um, well, I know we're not going to get to everyone's questions. I apologize for that. There's it's a wonderful, great topic, and we'll, maybe we'll try to um, schedule some more, uh, either with, with with Steve or some of your colleagues, Steve, for the fall, just to kind of dive into some of the topics a little bit more in depth. Um, but I do have just a couple of housekeeping items to share before we sign off. Uh, as a reminder, immediately after this webinar, there is just a very, very brief survey. So please take a minute, fill it out, tell us how it went. We understand the technology issues that were coming up today. Um, but if there's anything else that you'd like to share with us, please do so. A uh, recording of the webinar and the slides will be available soon on our website. And then also keep an eye out for an email from me, hopefully later today. Um, 
I also wanted to let everyone know that we just announced, we just scheduled another new webinar for next week, next Wednesday around this, well, in the afternoon. Um, we're going to talk about online farm stores and then also alternative distribution options. It's, you know, a really big topic for folks trying to kind of pivot and transition how they're selling things. Um, you know, <laughs> in the, now going forward. Uh, and so we're gonna have a panel of farmers with us to share their experiences using various um, online platforms and then tips for navigating some of the logistical challenges that come with this type of, of market. Um, so I'll send a, a link to the regis registration for that webinar in my follow-up email as well. So I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today. A very, very sincere thank you to you, Steve. Um, it was really an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. You know, I'm so so wonderful to have such experts kind of giving us um, information, experience, experiential information, then also, of course, all the research that um, that you use to make your decisions. And I'd like to thank everyone out there in the audience. I love all the thumbs up and um, clapping hands that are coming by for your interest and attention. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for being flexible with us in this very difficult and challenging time. Um, I do hope that we're all able to connect again soon. So have a wonderful, lovely afternoon wherever you're at and goodbye for now. <laughs>